Hello, brothers and sisters in Adama. Thank you for coming together with us in this Dhamma space of Lumpur. Let us all put our palms together and pay respects to Lumpur. Three bows. First bow. Second bow. And third bow. Lumpur, I'd like to invite you to lead us in a short guided meditation first. How long should we do? Um, as you wish. <laughs> 20? Two <20? hours. laughs> 30 minutes? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, okay. let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. All right, I'll give a bit of instruction, but I think most of us are fairly well versed. Um, in meditation. <clears throat> so listen to sound. Let go of thought. Listen to sound. Notice the silence of listening. The silence of awareness, the silence of knowing. So during this time, let go of planning and past future considerations. Just try to be awake to the way things are. Listen to sound. Silent attention, no thought. Feel your hands, feel the warmth or tactile sensations in the hands. Let that be conscious. Notice the silence of awareness. Listen to sound. Perceive sound as in awareness. Perceive sound as in awareness. Rather than the sound is out there, the sound is in awareness. Feel your hands. <clears throat> Feelings of your hands are in awareness. So notice that sound, tactile feelings of the hands are both objects in awareness. Take a thought. I am meditating. Before you say it, notice silence. And say, I am meditating. Notice the silence after. Notice the silence of no thought. And thought as an object. Feel the breathing of the body as an object in awareness. Feel an in-breath, awareness with an in-breath. Feel an out-breath, awareness with an out-breath. The breath is an object, changing object in awareness.
Feel the out breath. Put a lot of attention into the end of the out breath. Sustain awareness right to the end of the out breath. So awareness with one in breath. Awareness with one out breath. And then when your mind starts thinking and you notice that, notice the space after the thought. Notice the end of thought. Don't try to get rid of thinking, but try to get to know it as an object that comes and goes. So the breath, thought, sound, bodily feelings, these are objects coming and going in awareness. Awareness is the background, conscious space within which things come and go. So be that conscious background, knowing the way things come and go. Thoughts, emotions, memories. But use the breath as your anchor. So one breath in, awareness with one in breath, one breath out, right to the end of the out breath. So don't tense up by concentrating on the breath. Just sustain the balance of awake and knowing for one breath in, one breath out. All right, let's try that and see what happens.
All right, let's stop there. Thank you, Long Paul. We would now like to request for the Dhamma. Rama Jaloka Dipati Sahampati Katanjaliyan Diwarangaya Chata Santi Dasata Paraja Kajatika Dese Tudamang Anukam Pimampajang Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Santo Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Santo Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Santo Tassa Utang Dhammang Sankhamu Sam Hello everyone. Greetings from Tisarana. It's autumn, middle autumn, so the uh, days are getting very short and the leaves have mostly been blown away from the trees. It's not very cold, it's raining. Uh, we have some sickness, Venerable and Ajahn Pavaro has shingles and Venerable Amasiri has a lingering E. coli infection. I'm as healthy as a horse. So life goes on in different ways. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> very good feeling in the monastery right now. <clears throat> One of the things I'm very pleased about is that you know we have a small sangha of four bhikkhus and one samanera, and the four bhikkhus are all teaching now, which is really quite lovely. So uh Venerable Siri, Venerable Siri Mado, this is their sixth year, I think, as bhikkhus. Right, yeah. the sixth year, and uh, so Ben Ramasiri was teaching yesterday. Uh, so stars in the suttas on Mahamogalana and Gulimala, and Ben Siri Mehta was teaching to old group of friends in Peterborough. Ajahn Pavar was teaching right now at this very moment with the Auto Buddhist Society, and I'm here, so that I find very um, encouraging that. Our little Sangha can give back you know, some teaching and some encouragement because we are we are so well cared for and taken care of and uh, people are so very generous. So that's nice that we can give back a little bit. Um, so this is our last uh, session. Next year we'll start another one. I guess Bita, Bita is very good at organizing these things. I'll be off to Thailand for a uh, a month and then Singapore for a couple of weeks and Malaysia for a couple of weeks. And I, I do this teaching tour now every year and I have very, very good friends there. So I look forward to that. Um, yeah. So, and then in the winter, we have our winter retreat, January, February, March. We close down our work projects and try to do a lot of formal bhavana, um, which works quite well. The Dhamma Hall project is going well, very slow, but still the uh, workmanship is quite exquisite. And um, yeah, we're, we're very pleased with how it's going. So talk about Dhamma. We, uh, as human beings, we're, we have very complex uh, consciousness. The experience of being human is very complex. We can, and we can experience, we can be angry, we can love, we can experience fear, courage, we can be obsessed with thought, we can experience joy and awe. So there's a whole range of um, experiences because of memory too. We're very complex because of memory. 
so we have a Nirasso has a dog. You might have heard about our dog. He's our he's a uh, uh, a Bernese mountain dog. And uh, although it's Nirasso's, he's become our emotional support dog now. We all love hugging him, and he loves wagging his tail. And you look at Bruno. I says Bruno's got a pretty good life. Very simple, very friendly fellow. And I, I once said that to Ajahn Chah about a cat in London that we had. I said, I said to Long Paul, I said, the cat seems to have a pretty good life. And he retorted right away, do you want to be one? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd really want to be Bruno, but I'm not going to, I have no choice right now. So anyway, human consciousness, a human experience is very complex. And so we have the capacity for love. We have the capacity for hate. And it, it's good to reflect on the difference between, say, like the experience of love is contingent on whatever situation you're in. So we can experience love and the experience of hatred and all the variations of those positive and negative things, we can that can also be part of our, our our experience, again, contingent on circumstances. So there's love which is circumstantial and hatred which is circumstantial. But we can also um, we can also intend love. We can make the intentions of love, or we can make the intentions of hatred. And that's different than circumstance, isn't it? So when I you know, when I make intentions of love, that's what we call metta bhavana. Think of metta as loving kindness and bhavana as the cultivation. So when I intend and when I'm aware of my intentions, so I have to be aware of my intentions, I intend and I'm aware of it, that's different than just the experience of love. So the experience of love can have a whole range of uh, intensities and meanings. So I, uh, I, love, I love autumn, or I love my mom, or, or whatever. So that's actually the word love is very hard to define in that way. But the intention to love in Buddhism is quite simple. It's the, it's the intention of goodwill. The intention to um, not harm or not hurt. Uh, and that we can, we can cultivate that. It's obviously very important to cultivate. So even though my experience of life might be negative, so let's say something happens, a, a window, I, I accidentally break a window or something and I feel annoyed at that. That annoyance is just contingent on the situation, it's an experience. But what's important is what I do with that afterwards. What, what is, what, what's my uh, attitude to that? What does my mind do with that? And that, what I do with it afterwards is what intention is about all human activity moment by moment is intentional. Even though it's inadvertent, I might not, um, let's say I break the window and then I get annoyed at myself and I just start crit criticizing myself. Oh, you're dumb or you're so sloppy or something like that. Now that might be inadvertent and just kind of habit, but it's still intentional. I'm still making, I'm making the decision somewhere back in my consciousness to be self-critical towards myself, which is aversion. Right? So when we talk about love as intention, love and kindness as intention, we have to be quite attentive to our inner world, don't we? You have to have an awareness which is present and witnessing this, the flow of consciousness that we are experiencing. If we're not, then inadvertently, we can pursue 
pathways which are, are unskillful, intentions which are unskillful. And this is very important on, in so many ways, but this is really what we mean by Buddhist practice. You know, we kind of ask, you know, how is your practice going? And sometimes people think that means like, was your meditation really peaceful and blissful? So it sometimes gets um, limited to that. Or, but by practice, we we mean we mean that that one of the things we mean by the, many things by that. But one of the things we mean is that uh, ability to witness your inner world and understand where you're coming from, where where your speech is coming from, where your actions are coming from, where your thoughts are coming from, uh, and then. Obviously, from that, make decisions as much as you can to move towards uh, attitudes which are liberating. So attitudes of, of aversion or anger uh, aren't going to live, not, not liberating. So one of the problems we have as human beings is we have the intention and the motivation and the encouragement, maybe the idealism, to live a loving life, to live a life of loving kindness. And yet push comes to shove, and there we are, we're annoyed and angry. And that's just an experience that comes up because of causes and conditions. So you're, you know, you've, you've got the flu, or you just got some bad news, or you broke the window, and you feel it irritated. So that arises because of causes and conditions. And to ask yourself never to have anger or never to have annoyance or irritation, that's asking too much. thats I don't think that's really human. You can ask yourself that, or you can say that to yourself. I will not get angry this week. I will not be annoyed this week. I will not be critical this week. Good luck. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't work that way because... Because circumstances trigger all things. Because we're emotional beings, uh, we have we have memory, all manner of things. So practice isn't practice isn't the demand of perfection on an emotional level or on a whatever, but practice is the suggestion to awaken to your inner world, and when the motivation is towards alienation and separation from others, fear and anger, then don't believe that. Witness it as, as something, as an object. And when your motivation is towards generosity and uh, moral restraint and helping others and loving kindness, then cultivate that, act, activate that, make that very, very uh, important in your life. That's quite But all these underlying principles of Buddhist practices, we like morality um, the way we can not uh, stealing and so on and so forth part of the boundaries is our, our social responsibilities if I'm a family person or I'm a professional person and I have vocational boundaries and so on these these define our kind of worldly journey kind of vehicle we travel and all the time all the time we're trying to cultivate this capacity of inner vigilance witnessing the way things are even if it's complicated, even if it's if, even if the external world is very complicated, all the time we have to know our minds, know our thoughts, know our intentions. This is this in itself is 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 a challenge, but it's not a demand that you be perfect. Right, the suggestion of witnessing is not a demand that you love everyone all the time, that you like everyone all the time, that you even like Buddhism, or that you like your teacher, or that you like a monastery, you like your family. It's not that at all. It's just witnessing how you respond and react to life. And we all do that, otherwise we'd be crazy. We're just reacting on any old emotion, be crazy. But Buddhist practice is like really, really encouraging that 
inner vigilance and in, in, in listening. And that's where, where meditation practice is so very helpful because when you put aside a bit of time and you dedicate it to not going out into the world of emails or um, work responsibilities or family obligations, you don't go out into the world as it were, you stay home in the awareness of your own inner world, you strengthen this capacity for inner witnessing. Even if your meditation is like totally pathetic, is you know, like even if you're restless or it doesn't seem profitable, that's actually not so important. The important thing is that that one just stops, stops the outward movement into all manner of things and, and just witnesses what the mind is doing. So meditation as uh as an experience oftentimes is not pleasant. You can be very restless or think it's very unfruitful or whatever, but it's not it's not the intention to be pleasant. The intention is to witness. So any amount of stopping and noticing what's going on is going to be profitable for the complex parts of your life. If you never do that, then you don't you don't really train the mind. So this is practice, training and witnessing. And then if you start to really witness your inner world, you get good at it. You should like anything else, you just get good at it. Play the piano, you'll get good at it. Weave a rug, you'll get good at it. Make an omelet, you'll get good at it. So you have to do it. And that that practice in the mornings that we do, that's the, the intention there. Then. That's what you have to really check out. What is your intention when you meditate? Is your intention to get something? some kind of experience, well, then, then it's always based on getting something. But if your intention is to witness the way things are, it's like this, that I feel bored, or boredom is like that, or I'm not getting anywhere in a practice, I'm not getting it, oh, this is really nice. The, the witnessing is the most important part. Going back to intentions of love, Metta bhavana. One of the one of the problems we all face as meditators and as I would say idealists, I think we all usually are quite idealistic. We read very very high literature. We read about you know saintly people who whose minds don't seem to flutter at all. Um, we read about fantastic meditative accomplishments. And then there's us, <laughs> your garden variety meditator, right? Who struggles with with all all manner of inner workings or or, or uh, reactions to things, mm -hmm. and and one can feel very disappointed about one's practice, as it were. But that's one's experience. That's not one's practice. That's one's experience. And it's important to notice the difference is that my, if my experience uh, in a day at work has been where I, you know, maybe I said something gruffly to someone or I, I didn't get something right, that's an experience. I do my best. But that's not practice. Practice is really noticing how I'm responding to that, all the experiences that I have. And one of the, we, one of the things I think we do very wrongly is we we respond with harsh judgments. We judge our inner world rather than awakening to our inner world. Now, I think like those of us who are gathered here are very good and we are committed to goodness. So it's not like we're narcissistic or that we're evil or that we're intentionally bad. I, I've never found that. I found the folk that I meet online or other places, we have really very, very high intentions. But those intentions can very, very much become a kind of frozen into ideals. And then from those, those ideals, they become um, ways of, of a kind of like Lopa Sumedha and Ajahn Suchita say, it's like an inner tyranny. You get tyrannized by these judgments which isn't awareness at all, right? It's not really awareness. It's just another kind of mindset which has been conditioned through attachment to idealism. So when you say to yourself, I should have been more kind, 
Yeah. Like in our family, we used to joke, uh, yeah, if your mother had wheels, she'd be a bus. Yeah, I should be this or I should be that. But but it's like that, you know, this is life is like this. So so then then you start to 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 try to attend to the intention of self-criticism and self-judgment. Self-evaluation is fine. Yeah, I could have done that better. Sure. And I'll try to be more careful, sure. But that's not aversion. You know, self um, self-evaluation is not self-aversion. Uh, so dosa bhavana, I don't know if that's correct in Pali, but dosa bhavana would be the cultivation of aversion. And we can very easily do that to ourselves, ironically, from a good intention. It is a kind of cruel irony. Actually. You know, you know, why do you people? And 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 we want to function in a way which is helpful to others and helpful to ourselves, and yet we can end up criticizing ourselves and judging ourselves because we don't meet the ideal. So, if you are att attentive to the workings of your inner mind, you'll see that thoughts of self-criticism, if they're from aversion, are not thoughts of loving kindness. Obviously. And then, and then the task is not then to judge that, because you can do that too, can't you? You can see how this could be a, a really endless loop. So you find yourself self-critical, and you say, well, there you go, I'm self-critical again. But that's the same ballgame. That's the same problem, right? So the language that you present to your own mind, the language you use, has to come from right understanding. Sama, samaditi and, and right language is called samasankapa. So you, in your, in your attentiveness to your inner world, you really start to look at what kind of language do I use inside? What kind of language is being um, perpetuated in thought? Ideally, you, you start to move to no thought and silence. That's the idea. You try, that's really quite important if you could do that. But, but, right thought is a thing. And so you, you start to ask yourself, what's the language I'm using? And if the language is, you're not up to the mark, Viridamo, you broke that window, you know, you, 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 you know, you've been a monk long enough, you should know better. That's not the language of loving kindness, obviously. The language which is, well, the, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. Be more careful, sure. But the language of self-criticism is not the language of loving kindness. So I've been I've been playing around and suggesting to people the language of intention. Now, this is the language of intention rather than the language of experience. And and in that I've been suggesting a triad of of phrases, of words. I said. In, in, especially for the circumstance of self-criticism and self-disparagement, which I have certainly suffered from, and I, I suspect many of us have. Um, so the language I'm suggesting is three phrases. I love you. I have always loved you. I will always love you. Now, that's the language of intention, not the language of relationship. And you see the difference. You, you say that to a person, well, that's not going to happen. You may not always love this person. You will and you won't. But you can begin to cultivate that to the flow of consciousness. So something comes up which is highly self-critical um, or critical of others. And you feel that. You feel that in your mind. And you say to that mindset, I love you. I've always loved you. I will always love you. What does that do to the mind? Or to my mind, it stops it. It, it. it brings it to silence because it's acceptance. It's acceptance of the way things are. It's not liking it. It's not that. It's like coming into the moment with even this negative state of mind that the mind is now open to the whole possibility of the human experience. Because the human experience can be, you can you can have very evil thoughts, you can have very de deatific thoughts, very Brahma thoughts, right? As human beings, we can go through that whole range, and all of it is a part of nature. You can you can love your children, hate your children, 
You don't act on the hatred, hopefully, right? But that's just part of the way human mind can work because we have that range. We can have memories of someone that has harmed us and we want to murder them. And that was 10 years ago. Maybe someone had a really bad divorce and then 10 years down the line, you, you have that memory gets triggered by something and you have a, a really hateful thought. It's not your fault. Don't act on it. Don't believe in it. But what if you said to that very thought, I love you. I've always loved you. I will always love you. And that's not liking it. It's like accepting it into the mind. That's a very strong way to put it. Lompos Semedo's way to put it is maybe more. Anyway, it's different. It says, um, it's like this, and it all belongs. That's a nice way to put the same idea. It all belongs. Everything that comes up in your inner world is a part of nature, even though it might seem apparent, like horrible and, and, and so on, but it is natural. Right? These impulses are natural and neither right nor wrong. Acting on them, sure, that's different. So we have morality. We have um, moral boundaries. We have responsibility. We have the intention not to harm with body, speech, or mind. So we, we try that. And the more we can allow, I, I suggest, the, the kind of negative things that we experience as humans, we can just allow it to be as it is. And not create a self around it. It's not who I am. Uh, hateful memory is not who I am. It's a hateful memory. Um, uh, a, a, a mistake I make by speaking unskillfully to someone is a mistake I make. It comes and it goes. And if I don't put loving kindness into that mindset, then will I not perpetuate, will I not be doing dosa bhavana? Say I, I I inadvertently do something. I go back to my kuti and it's been harmful to someone in some way. I apologize or whatever. And then I come back to my kuti. Oh, you're dumb. You're terrible. You're terrible. You're terrible. That's dosa bhavana, isn't it? That's cultivating intentions of aversion. If I make no correction, I say, well, the person deserved to be yelled at. Well, that's also not it. But I don't think we're at there. Most of us, we want to be good. So if I, if I, if something happens and it, and it brings up in me self criticism, self hatred, if I, if I don't take that self criticism, self hatred, and 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 change it to metta, and I actually reinforce the aversion, then I just make aver uh, aversion something stronger in consciousness, don't I? So something comes up, and the habit is self-criticism, self-judgment, and say, I love you, I've always loved you, I will always love you, or it all belongs. So then the mind comes, then you, you start to see that awareness and loving kindness are very coexistent. They're, they're not, because loving kindness, not loving kindness or metta is not just about me and another person. It's an attitude that is a part of, I think, authentic awareness open-hearted awareness with you, if you will, or whatever, because it's it's that which accepts everything. And then you act, you act with body, speech, and mind appropriately. So I might have an impulse to hurt someone, verbally say, when I, I really want, I really want to jab them, I want revenge or whatever. That's an impulse. I accept that. I, I accept it into consciousness, but I don't follow it. I don't pursue it. If I don't pursue it, then it dies. It's, it goes to cessation because I haven't reinforced it. If I hate myself for it, I reinforce some kind of hatred. If I indulge in it, I reinforce it. So part of our, our, our path of liberation is the willingness to accept into consciousness things which are often kind of unacceptably, you know, the painful, um, painful memories that we have or, or emotions. And what we're asked to do is not distract, not to run away, but actually face up to those difficult mindsets and say, I love you, I've always loved you, I've always loved you, or it all belongs. And in that, the, you need faith, you need trust. You need the trust to just hold this in awareness and let it run its course. And it will run its course because it's a Nietzsche, it changed, it began, it ended. And that's not who you are. You are not all that self 
definition, emotion. You are the awareness which knows that. You're the witness which knows that. So then you start to see that metta bhavana as a practice isn't just something that you do like for 15 minutes in your meditation. It's an attitude of constant remembrance of accepting the way things are. And then externally, I do my utmost not to harm anyone. So externally, I begin to see that you as a human being don't want to suffer. And we're the same. And so that begins to play out when you see something happening. And, and it's painful. And you see the pain, you say, I'm not going to inflict that pain on others. I'm not going to do that. That's the intentionality in, 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 in social, social atmospheres. One of the things I was talking about in the last talk with, I think, the OBS, but all these horrific news events now, Gaza, Israel, there was so much, so much, so much suffering. And what I was suggesting is that I think people have this tendency to doom scroll. You know, you see one horrible, horrible image and then another horrible image and another horrible image. And it'll just be this kind of... Um, Wow, what's that? What's that? And what? how can we respond to that? Well, politically, I can't respond to that. But I can try to see if I can bring compassion into my heart when I hear about these events. And how do you, how do you bring compassion into your heart in these horrific events? How do you not just go to horror? Well, the way I do it is I, I, I have a picture I have several pictures from BBC or something of a person that's suffering, something that I could relate to. So I have a picture of a woman who is just experienced the um, earthquake in Turkey, and she's just lost most of her family. And it's the most sad, sad picture. She's just holding herself in tears. And, and what I do with that I thought how can I you know how can I be a part of this horror and yet not get so jaded that it, that, that it affects me negatively well I, I realize if I look at the picture and I'm silent and the silence is very important rather than just go from one picture to another I hold my mind with silent attention on this being the suffering being I don't think about oh how horrible what are they going to do they don't have a family I don't go to thought but I just allow my attention in silence to be with this picture. And that obviously opens my heart. Obviously, what else would it do? It's obvious. And so the heart feels compassion. I can reflect, yeah, life is, life is difficult. Birth is difficult. I can do that. But I don't have to go to thought. I can just, yeah. Now that doesn't make me depressed. It's, it, it makes me, I think, a better human. Whereas if I just go through news cycles, that's really depressing and frightening. So I don't do that. Um, and then I have another uh, another picture actually, and I counter that too. So I have a I have a few pictures around compassion, and I find it a very very powerful practice. It's not abstract. It's a picture that touches my heart, and then I just try to abide in that sense of deep compassion. And just let that sit there. Just let that sit there without doing anything, fixing anything. But I realize that the human experience also has, has a lot of beauty and joy in it. So then I recently came across a photo. It's the most gorgeous photo. It's a, it is a, it is a, a, a ballet teacher who is 90 years old. And she's standing in front of a tall, well, compared to her height, a tall gentleman who is very young. He looks 22-ish. And she's standing in, in front of him and she's holding her hands on his shoulders. She's so short. And she's looking up into him with a most joyous smile, like a teacher encouraging her student. And, and this, uh, this, the, the student, the, the man, he's looking down at her with the most joyous, appreciative smile. And then there's a third person in this picture of three people. And it's another student. 
and she is smiling at both of them. And it's the most exquisite sense of human joy that we can also have. So I focus on that picture. Yeah, and, and I try to bring it to the heart. And these, these teachings on, on the Brahma Viharas, I think, are very, very significant in terms of, because sometimes, you know, when we talk about Buddhism, sometimes we talk about like these very refined attainments that none of us really understand. <laughs> and then people talk about them and so on. But the human heart is not hidden from us. It is what we live with and in and are. And it seems to me the if one were to speak of a goal in human development in the Buddhist sense, it would be these the development of the Brahma Viharas, development of compassion, loving kindness, joy. These are these are possibilities. And they're not kind of meditative expect, uh, uh, med, uh, attainments. They're things that we can notice in everyday life and we can encourage. So that's what, the way I try to do it. I try to, first of all, notice intentions of, of aversion and, and, and all that, which is, a, which is a big part of my character, self-criticism, self-judgment. Lompoa Samedi used to say to me, I don't have to criticize you. You just do it all the time. And and so, okay, that's part of my makeup, um, and and so I can work with that. That's at the inner level, but I'm I'm also a social being, you know, and and I and I I can connect to people and I can feel the pain, and that's not a bad thing. If I worry about the pain, that's a bad thing. I can't I can't fix everyone's pain, but I can I can relate to it as a human being. But I said I could connect to the joy too. And this very real development of the human heart, I think, is, is significant because it is the place of abiding where I think we're fulfilled. You know, love, loving kindness, these, these are the fulfillments. And I think that's where the craving mind is no longer interested. The craving mind is always interested in distractions, going out into all kinds of manner of things. But... When the human heart feels compassion or feels joy, not because it's been stimulated by something which is interesting or exciting. No, not that way, but because we've entered into that from our own resources. Then there's a kind of fulfillment. And then there's a kind of a, a resting in the heart, which doesn't require distractions, doesn't require a lot of distraction. So as human beings, we have that potential. We really have an incredible potential as human beings, but we also have a, a, the potential for cruelties you know, in, all, in all manner of difficulties. So obviously, as as Buddhist practitioners, you know we're we're moving towards that which is compassionate. But compassion isn't an ideal; it's an intention. It's different. So, what's the difference between "I love you"? as an experience, and then I love you as an intention. Metta bhavana, as opposed to the experience of love, it's different. And no matter how much cynicism or negativity we might experience, we can move towards the other, we can move that by just doing the work, doing the work of, of intention, so on. Okay, I'll leave that for your reflection. Thank you, Lumpo. Andamayam o Vadagata Sadu Karan Kadama Se Sadu 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 Anu Modami. Any questions for anyone? Thank you, Lampa. Um, we shall now open the floor for questions and answers. Anyone who has got a question, uh, could you please uh, raise mm -hmm. your hand and uh, we we'll invite you to unmute. Yes, we have Miri. Miri, come past. Miri, Hi, Miri. You unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Are you in How Australia you? or India? I'm in Australia. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Um, I plan to go back to India at the end of November. So. Okay. Yeah. Give my best to David. Yeah, he's he's arriving next Thursday for a month here in Perth. Okay. <clears throat> Perth, Australia. Um <laughs> yes, I 
I loved your suggestion to to with that that take that picture of the person the, uh-huh. the the suffering and to to look at it just in in quietness and feel the compassion I just that really struck a chord because I've been I've just been so sad about this this war in this in this conflict in the Israel Palestine and it occurred to me that I mean another way that might one might do that is to when the news is on and there's very vivid imagery is just to turn the sound off and watch the scenes and the quietness of having the sound off might trigger the quietness in the mind and create a similar effect. Yeah, you can experiment, can't you? Yeah. But yeah. I, it, it's the, you know, do you know Simone Weil, the great Christian I've heard mystic? of it. Yes. She yes. has a line which is, silent attention is the greatest gift. And and it, you know it's true when we can when we can attend to a, a person and attend to them from silence without all our you know stuff that we add to it, then we give them something I think very very valuable. And and so because I think in silence our, our ego minds get out of the way, and and we become available to compassion. Not that compassion is foreign to us, but become. But as long as we're just horrified by these things and thinking horrible thoughts, which is natural, and it is horrible, we 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 bypass that possibility. And sometimes it's hard to be silent because it's so shocking. So I mean, you do have to be careful because you don't you don't want the mind just to become depressed or, 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 or so on. Yeah, it's it's like the there's a very strong sense of the doer arises and i think partly what what i find causes the suffering is a sense i can't do anything i you know i can only do yeah. so much and and so i think that silence silence is the sense of the doer and that's where the the sense of self gets out of the way yeah exactly yeah and then our doing is in our own contexts yeah our own yeah. resources you know our own possibilities the person we meet at the drugstore and all the rest of it. So, um, so we still connected, but we're not overwhelmed by that. Because yeah. those are those are just unimaginable, unimaginable human suffering. All of that. And I know, like I, I often talk about, like when I was t- caring for my mother. You probably heard me talk about this, but I. I I didn't know I, I would worry about her, obviously. And so whenever she had a lot of pain from rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis, I would osteoarthritis, I would I would see her in pain and she would see me in pain. She'd try to hide the pain. I would worry about the pain and and that kind of cycle of worry. And I realized that wasn't really compassion, it was worry. So then, you know, having done everything I could constantly, then I would just just look at her and I'd say, yeah, mom has her come. I have my come. But in the silence, then I went back to compassion rather than tripping out on worry. Still did things as much as I could. And that was a good lesson. It was a kind of obvious lesson. But I can't fix old age. It's not something I can do. I can facilitate her aging process and give her that kind of support. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Miri. Thank Are you ever coming to Perth, Canada? <laughs> yeah. But if if the if the karma lets me, yes. There you if, go. Let's hope your does. karma lets you. <laughs> okay. Nice okay. to see you. There's a question here in the chat box. Okay. Uh, the question is from a person here by the name of Bikuni. The question is, Ajahn, when I do metta meditation for myself, I always say you. Example, may you be well. Well, I, I actually mean it's for myself. 
this works very well. I feel like sending out meta wishes and on another level, receiving meta. I also you, use you when I speak to myself in thoughts, like you have to do this or this you must stop. So this is my normal way of addressing myself. Is there a contradiction to using you when doing meta meditation for oneself? It doesn't really matter, it's just words. So words are just conventions. Call yourself George if you want. Um, <laughs> it's really like la language. Language can be descriptive. Language can define. Language can admonish. Language can evoke. So you want something that evokes um, whatever you want in applying metta. So if I use George for myself, it doesn't work. It doesn't evoke an image. Uh, maybe if I use Virdhamma, may you be happy, or may I be well. So it's just language is not language is not uh, absolute. So the, the the whole point of it is, does the language work? So if she uses you, or 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 that that's not the point. Is is it is it the is the effect on the mind? one of open-hearted acceptance, one of, of um, joy, whatever, whatever, whatever the meditation is about. But what I'm, I'm pointing to is not just a meditate, you know, like the classic structures of metta meditation. I'm just pointing to a constant attitude, a constant attitude. So sometimes we, you know, metta meditation becomes a kind of stylized thing. You do, what do you do? You do, <laughs> you do this person, that person, and then you do another person, then you do the enemy, then you do yourself. You know, this is sort of standard stuff. I can't do that because it's just too, it's too clinical for me. Now, I'm sure it works. Some people really like it. But for me, it just seems that the, as inner attention is refined, you say, oh, this is, this is a feeling of aversion, let go. And so something more like, like awareness as being constant, open-mindedness, that seems more, more what I'm pointing to. And then language doesn't really matter. Then it, it kind of, you know, it's more from silence and the, and the effect on your heart. So when your heart is self-critical, your heart closes. When, you're, when, you're, when your heart is forgiving and open, it opens. It's very, it's, it becomes very, very simple. So it's more a more a chakra centered meditation rather than a head centered thought ideas kind of thing. You know, language, language is just it's like the the evocative part of language is very interesting. So when I say I love you, I've always loved you, I will always love you, that might evoke something. I told that to one friend, and she said, "Ugh," she cringed at that thought. Because she found it difficult to say it to herself. Well, that's oh, that's smarmy. I can't do that. I don't know why? <laughs> What's the problem? But it evoked something in her, which was interesting. So if you like, if you know, if you if you make it an absolute definition, then of course it's just about. It's not the use of language I'm I'm, I'm pointing to, but but like like if I do if I want to bring the heart to gratitude, then I I just say lompo semego. And that evokes gratitude. It's not some definition of Opa Sumedo as a person. It evokes that feeling of gratitude. So, so the use of language to evoke rather than just to define is, is a very skillful use of language. Thank okay. you, Um There's a question from Chris, but Chris is here. May I perhaps invite Chris to unmute himself and ask the question? Sure. Hello. Um, Hi, Chris. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for the, the talk this evening. Um, okay. I'm, I'm not sure if this is a question that uh, would take a five-second answer or a, a five-hour answer, <laughs> but um, my question is, where do intentions arise from? Uh, and I'm wondering if it's possible also to use that knowledge to uh, notice intentions more often and uh, craft them to be more skillful as well. 
Good question. Good question. Five hours? <laughs> um, very good question. Well, let's say we get conditioned in childhood and maybe before um, through cir circumstances to respond to life through the pain and joy we have. And we are happiness-seeking beings. So our intentions, first of all, are much grounded in very biological things, food and survival and things like that. And then the more complex parts of our, our social uh, part of our development come, and then we develop intentions to be safe or, and then something happens where we feel threatened and we develop attentions around that. So there's a whole structure of intentions which create our personality and the way then we respond to life. And at some point we become self-conscious, we become self-aware that our inner world has, you know, has, has stuff that we want to look at and understand. But those intentions that, that have been conditioned by circumstances and family and culture and time uh, already are playing out, are beginning to play out. And, and then for some reason, we become self-conscious. Usually the reason is because we're suffering. And, and basically we want to get out of that suffering because we are, we are kind of happiness guided beings. We want to be happy. And, and so that, then the, the suffering brings forth a questioning. And now if we are taking responsibility for the suffering, then we'll look and we'll say, well, why is that happening? We'll see cause and effect. If we have no self-reflective capacity, we'll just blame. Problems there, out there. And that's a narcissistic kind of personality. Uh, you know, the problem is always out there and that person can never be free. No way. But for us, you know, we kind of most people have enough reflective capacity that they do, do see there is responsibility here. And that's the beginning of insight, the beginning of, of wisdom and the beginning of different intentions. So let's say if you, uh, you know, you're, you're a young man and you get a hot car, you get a Mustang or something, you're tooling around and then you get road rage or something like that. And then you suffer from road rage at some point, you know, your friends say, hey, man, that's not, that's not very good. That's not cool. And you begin to, oh, yeah, I've got to cool that down. So you can see your intentions are, are motivated by trying to get out of suffering, maybe by cultural norms. Some of those intentions in the cultural norms can be bad, you know, and so on. And then, of course, you come across a teaching. And that's very important to have a teaching, to have a teacher to have a kind of pathway that says, okay, there is a methodic way that you can approach this whole realm of intentions and begin to uh, encourage intentions which are wholesome and let go of intentions which are unwholesome, hence the teaching. So from the teaching, you get suggestion. From suggestion, you start to make intention. So someone's, you know, you, let's say you get, um, someone gets overwhelmed by, uh, uh, let's say worry you know some person's into worry and, and the teacher says well can you notice the bodily feeling in your uh, when worry comes up and you have kind of kind of know them and, but then you make a specific intention I'm going to notice what the body feels like when there's worry and that sets forth more mindfulness more body awareness and less worry and so it kind of unfolds from that that was five minutes <laughs> yeah less than five hours <laughs> there you thank go you. does that help yeah it does thank you very much yeah. okay all right chris sujata 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 can you unmute yourself yes there you go yeah Bye. i thought i'd I changed that to Gabrielle because it's confusing. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Um, 
And I, I have to ask this because I, I know I'm not going to be happy if I don't. Um, I'm at a point with meditation and with sitting practice where I seem to be really hooked on this idea that breath meditation is the meditation and um, and I don't do well with breath. And so um, the the um, approach that you and Ajahn Sumedho and some of the other monastics who uh, encourage the knowing, um, the witnessing, uh, being present um, is, is uh, um, you know, something that I feel intuitively is in the right direction. But I keep getting in the weeds around this whole thing that you got to do the breath, you got to do the breath. And, you know, you're, you're trying to get John and, and um, you know, because I hear these messages uh, from other monastics. So um, any words of advice? It's a terrifying problem. And I, 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 I mean, I see what you're talking about, but maybe it doesn't have to be either or. So if you, if you, the way I like to explain it is awareness with breathing rather than concentration on the breath. Mm -hmm. Does that difference make, do you see that difference? Okay, I so I, have, I was going to say, so you, I have, you establish the knowing, establish the knowing on sound, whatever, whatever you want, and then the knowing with an in breath. The knowing with an out breath, with an in breath, with an out breath, and then the letting go of craving. So the craving you get from this Theravada thing about jhanas is, is to get something. So then you take that whole jhana teaching. You say, well, it has to be in the context of the four noble truths. So the problem with some of that teaching is that sama samadhi seems to be like this separate thing. That I get, and then <laughs> then there's the other bit. But obviously, sama samadhi must fit within the four noble truths. And what's the function of the four noble truths? Is nirodha, the abandonment of craving. Correct. So if you are meditating with craving, you got wrong view, wrong effort, wrong understanding, and it's a shamazu. <laughs> but if you then are attentive to the inner workings, and as you're with one in breath, one out breath, and you just notice the whole sense of wanting or striving, or you notice the sense of trying to get rid of thought when thought arises, because that's also tanha. Thought arises, and oh, it's thought, it's like that. Next out breath, next in breath, next out breath. Then you're always practicing the knowing, but you're also practicing the four noble truths because you're working towards the abandonment of tanha. And then whatever level of calmness comes, it comes from the abandonment. If you look at if you look at the third noble, second third noble truth, it's the letting go, the abandonment, the relinquishment. That's the language that I feel more comfortable with. So then the word John also can get defined in different ways. So in the Chinese tradition, um, it's not defined as absorption. It's defined as meditation, dhyana. So the particular interpretation that we have around the word jhana tends to come from the Visuddhimagga, which is a commentary 10th century or whatever. So some of those recommendations aren't necessarily um, the only way to think of that word. But it gets so indoctrinated into people's minds that they're always trying to attain to something and they don't see, well, that's tanha. That self is craving, craving to get something, craving. So if, you, if you're using the language of niroda, which is abandonment, relinquishment, letting go, and you're with one in-breath and one out-breath, then it's not an either and or situation. But, but having been, you know, you have a, you have a kind of, Sila Bhatta Paramasa around this. Sila Bhatta, you know, it's a cultural conditioning that Theravada sometimes gets, people get caught up in that. 
And that begins to just condition your whole attitude to, to, you know, I have to get this, I have to get this. And that's what you have to look at. That's a culturally conditioned thing. And it defines a sense of self and identity as a terrified Buddhist. But if you if you then go back and read the Four Noble Truths and rethink Sama Samadhi and think about it more in terms of how can it facilitate the letting go of desire? So if in one in-breath I'm letting go of desire, in one out-breath I'm letting go of desire, then I'm I'm in line with all those other factors. So it's not. You know, it's not counter to, to, to some of those ideas. You make it sound so simple, Bonte. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a, it, I, I mean, I, 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 I empathize with that, that situation because many people read about that and then they get so, so wound up with trying to get something. My teachers never taught that. My teachers are all, you know, they're always about letting go. Letting go, letting go. They, they encourage meditation, undoubtedly. But also about letting go and, and witnessing. Guru and Thai being the knowing. Yeah. Yeah, I sat down and wrote about 15 different objects that I could think of that could possibly be, uh, I you know, possible to meditate on. But I've been really curious about this objectless meditation that it's in the knowing. Yeah. But but if you if you if you it doesn't have to be either or. It's more the attitude to the object. It's not about the objects, but the awareness. And, you know, it's not either or. You still can have an object, but the object just helps you to to uh, amplify awareness. You see what I mean? Because I think what happens is you think, well I have to focus on the object, suppress thought get the mind calm, blah, blah, blah. But that's not what we're doing in, in, in my my instance. It's it's just uh, like, you know, like I started this meditation, I said, listen to sound, right? And that's an object, but it's not about the object. Then feel the hands. It's the same awareness. You get the idea that's the same awareness. And then, okay, with the breath or the mantra, whatever you else. So it's not either or. But it is not, it's not like you find the perfect object. That's, that's, that's dangerous because then, oh, this object doesn't work. Let's have another object. Any objects. So pain is an object, right? And, and, and um, disappointment is an object. Frustration is an object. Thinking I'm not getting anywhere is an object. <laughs> so, so say to yourself, when you begin the meditation, I am hopeless. I am a hopeless meditator. And it feels like this. <laughs> but don't go for it. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, one boy. Okay. But don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, one boy. Um, are there any more questions from the floor? Anyone's got a burning question? Last question? Um, it looks like uh, everyone's happy today. I would now come to the end of the session, Long Po. Uh, but before before we end, Long Po, uh, it's um, this is the final session of the year with you. This is also the last, the second last weekend to the Vasa. Uh, next week is the last weekend of Vasa. Uh, we've been very privileged to have your time uh, this Vasa and throughout the whole year to receive your teachings and your guidance and to set our intentions on the right path. Uh, we're immensely grateful. Um, it, it is also traditional for, for some of us to come to, for, to the teachers to ask for forgiveness because we're all so far away from each other. We want to still take this opportunity in the virtual land and online to ask for your forgiveness as a worldwide community in Paul. So we'll begin that uh, with Shun Xiang leading us in the chanting and uh, paying respects for asking for forgiveness. We would like to ask everyone to join informally asking for forgiveness from Long Paul together. Please be Nanjali.
Let's pay our respects to Long Paul together with three bows. Bow. Please chant the verses together. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa. Please bow down and keep our heads lowered for the rest of the chant. Mahatere Pamadena Tawarata Yenakatang Sabang Aparadang Kamatu no Bante. Mahatere Pamadena Tawarata Yenakatang Sabang Aparadang Kamatu no Bante Mahatere Pamadena Tawarata Yenakatang Sabang aparadang kamatu no bante. Pang kamami tumhe hibi me commit to pang. Kamama bante. Vatu sava mangalangra kantu sava devuta. Sava buddha, sava dhamma, sava sankha. Nubhavena sada sauti bhavati te. Three bows together. Bow. Thank you, Lumpur. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you welcome. for your kindness. Thanks William, we'll see you soon. Corina, Michael, Zito. What else we got here? Bita, Shenzhen, see you all in Asia. See you, Lumpur. And anyone who's in Perth, Ontario, come visit. <laughs> okay, we'll say goodbye, huh? Thank you. Bye-bye.